Hi folks, welcome everyone to the Cartographer Office Hours. Today is the day after the Super Bowl. It also is uh, Monday Cartographer Office Hours. Great, let me share my screen real quick. Uh, there you go. I would like to give a warm welcome to, to all the maintenance team, to all the, the people behind the project and also to Mr. Scott Rosenberg. It's great, great to have you here especially because we'll discuss an idea that you provided. So that's great. Welcome. <clears throat> All right. Um, yeah, who would like to take notes for this session? I can take notes. Emily? Put you in there in a while. Um, okay, there you go. So first, Topic here, CRD short names. Uh, so I don't know if it's Scott Rosenberg, uh, if you're available to just provide any comment or intro to the idea. Uh, yeah. Um, so in general, I think that, um, you know, as I've been dealing more and more with cartographer, uh, having short names would make it much easier to run cube cuddle commands. Uh, just writing out the entire long names of the CRDs would be, is very tedious. Um, and so the idea was just to add um, some short names there. I did run a check through like Tanzu application platform and other environments. I would say, make them done. Uh, I ran some tests, uh, you know, on Tanzu application platform as well as in other Kubernetes clusters to see if there would be any overlapping of names, and I didn't find any either. Um, so that was, you know, in general, I put a list of the ones that exist, like in Tanzu application platform and things like that, to make sure we wouldn't overlap them. But that was the general idea, just to make it easier to run commands against the different CRDs. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for doing that. Um, that's very, very helpful. I think everyone is pretty much on board that uh, we should definitely do this. Uh, we just wanted to like take a minute to uh, like let everyone know that we're going to do this. And then if anyone had any objections to any of the short names, um, they could voice them now. Otherwise, we'd just move forward with it. So yeah, thanks, Scott, for putting that together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to the team for moving forward with, with this uh, request. Awesome. Okay, new RFC. Um, Joshua, I think this is your show from this point on. Yeah. I to match people selected. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, everything else is me, right? Um, cool. Uh, do you mind clicking on the readable one? Yeah, that'd be great. So this RFC is about adding a uh, top level params object to the match fields selector um, so that we don't have to do crazy things like that top YAML block um, where we have to like pick a param off. I, I actually don't even know if that'll work. I kind of just assumed that something like that would work based on some of our other selectors. Um, but we have to like pick a param by name and then, you know, pick up its value off that object. Um, and the other thing is right now we can, based on the match field selectors, we could pick params off of a workload, but we can't pick params off of a supply chain. Um, so you couldn't do any sort of conditional branching um, based on something that's only defined in a supply chain. Uh, and the example I provide here is, you know, maybe you have some sort of configuration um, that determines whether or not you want to push to uh, GitOps, uh, Git re repository, or um, a RegOps like re registry. And so, by giving access to params, we're basically enabling that workflow. I think this is super simple to do since this is what we do today for the stamper. Uh, we go ahead and we 
basically do the, our param hierarchy and then send params down to the stamper as part of the context. And what we've just implemented for options, there's a PR out for it, um, also takes a context. And so I think we could just pass params as part of that context. Does this support the fault value specified in the template? No, it wouldn't. That's kind of the, that's so that's the gotcha, right? Um, you you can't take the entire um, param hierarchy because at the option level, right? We don't have we haven't matched on a template yet, so we wouldn't be able to take the params from a template. The other interesting gotcha is that if it's not part of this issue, but we, we oftentimes talk about that a selector for a template should probably work kind of the same way as the top level supply chain selector. Um, and if we were to add params and match fields at the supply chain level, you wouldn't be able to use supply chain params at that point either. Because if you're selecting us, if you're trying to select a supply chain, all you have access to at that point is the workload. I don't know if I made that clear, but if you're like, if you wanted to select at the top level on a supply chain, you could only reference the workload params. If you want to select a template within a supply chain, you can use the workload params or the supply chain params, but you could never use the uh, the template params because you haven't made that decision yet. I'm wondering if instead of like a match fields, this becomes like match params or something outside of. Because right, right now, match fields is simply on the workload. I don't know. I don't, I'm just curious if like breaking it out gives us any more flexibility or like does it tie us to the ways that we've done things before? I think you're actually touching. I'm, I think you all just described this, but I'm just not fully making sure I understand. Um, when I see uh, on the what it is when in, in the match fields and you say params.promotion, for example, is that doing, is that automatically doing that hierarchy filling in or like a replace on whether it came from workload or came from the cluster supply chain? Or like, how am I saying which set of params I'm getting in that match field? Yeah, we have a hierarchy specified somewhere in the docs, right? Like, it's the same, I assume it'd be like the same hierarchy that we have today where. I'm not even going to pretend to know the actual okay, hierarchy, scroll. but it's it, it's down. in the code, right? There's some magic helper that when I say params in match field, it'll like resolve to one or the other. And if I wanted to say I don't want the magic helper and I just want to explicitly pick from somewhere, is that that's not a thing? Then you would probably have to reference it right off the workload. Um, the, David, sorry, if you scroll up. That that top block, like in theory, that very first YAML block, workload.spec params, some like you're you're picking the one with the name of something and then you're picking the value from that. Gotcha. So in Probably theory, you could do pick it directly off workload or do the magic hierarchy, but you can never say that, that's sort of just like an accidental because uh, we have these paths. Yeah. Um, Emily's yeah. point, match fields, match params. I don't have a huge opinion there. Um, is the idea here that, you know, params is this thing that's merged together, you know, in, in a lot of cases from different sources. And we want to make params kind of like a top level thing, like workload, but some kind of magic object. Then I think match fields kind of works for me because it's like, it's doing the same thing on something else that doesn't isn't actually a resource in the cluster, but you can treat like a resource in the cluster. It seems pretty reasonable. I mean, the whole point of this, it would seem, is that we're able to put the faults in our supply chain if we needed them, and also just make it a little easier to, like it's tidier just to say params and it is workload where you are explicitly jumping the uh, the params uh, hierarchy, right? Is that the best way to put it, Josh? Yeah. 
I think the other thing, the other call out right is like right now, if you only, if you had a param that was only specified in the supply chain, you couldn't do anything with it. Yeah. Yeah. Which you wouldn't want to if it was specified hard, but if it had a default, you would, right? There is no point uh, switching on a declared value at the top of the supply chain because that should always resolve one way and editing the supply chain is required to change it. Or do you perceive people wanting to like, I've got two paths through the supply chain, but your only way you'll ever get the other one is when I do the edit to the supply chain as like a constant if def or something like that, which is what it would feel like if you used value. Whereas if you use default value, that would make sense to me. Yeah. The only, the only way I could see you maybe wanting to do it based on actual concrete value in the supply chain is if it was templated out and you wanted to be able to make that you wanted to still manage one supply chain, but you wanted to template it at installation time. But that's a pretty contrived example. So, which is like if def, right? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That makes sense. I mean, I get that, but yeah. Yeah. True. Yeah. yeah. I get it. Yeah. And, and you're saying like when using YTT to generate your supply chains as you deploy them, that makes sense too. Okay. Yeah. And we're only supposed to introduce these, so I won't go into any further all the questions I could possibly ask. <laughs> I think one call out that I do want to make before we move on though, is that I don't think this breaks our rule um, of that we, we can statically analyze these things, right? Because we have all the information at the time. So this doesn't break our rule. That's why I asked about templates, but you're right. You couldn't even hope to. So yes, that's great. No, no dynamicism, no special per prerogative to set a param in the middle of a template generation either, right? <laughs> right. Any other comment regarding this RSD? No? <clears throat> okay. Can move uh, to a new one. Uh, would like to share your screen, Joshua, so you can read that or not a problem. I, I can try, if I share my screen, my upload usually dies and then my audio gets really bad. Um, uh, oh, no problem. I think you're doing a great job, Dan. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so this next one is, uh, Scott is planning on submitting uh, this as a separate RFC. So this is a comment that he made on the uh, RFC 18. Um, artifact tracing RFC. And he proposed an alternate status in the workload, uh, which takes a resource centric approach instead of an artifact centric approach. Um, and to me, anyway, it seems like long term, we could, we probably want to support some version of both. Um, right. And so Scott's going to submit this as a separate RFC that we can uh, contemplate in addition to RFC 18. His separate RFC doesn't aim to solve provenance. It just aims to allow representation of the graph without having to go around 20 different resources and correlate everything, which is still extremely important thing to do. But I just want to make sure I'm, that's, I have the right interpretation. Yep. Awesome. That sounds great. Does this RFC tackle the fact that we now have optional outputs and that we only need to know? Like, does it say we only need to know the ones selected and um uh the others are not going to be used for this workload because this is yeah. workload level status right yeah. yeah so the idea is that your resource list here would only represent the objects that exist in the cluster right so if there was a path not taken um it shouldn't be represented here if there was a path taken at one point and then that path changed because of something right uh, in theory, it should kind of only show the, the latest and greatest, the new representation. Um, but I think we've kind of talked about GCing those resources when yeah. you change your path in a different issue. So Right, yeah. So there's two, there's two sort of like prereqs there, GC. And then ultimately, we can do even better, but we'll have to make a really strong play to um, eliminate 
being able to switch GVKs and templates, all right? And then we can actually clean them up, but that's quite a ways down. Makes sense. Yeah, but this RFC is really just going to be about surfacing that information, right? Surfacing the information of what's uh, what's stamped out for a given workload. Great. Um, any other comment here? If not, we can move to the update to this particular RFC. So um, this is the snippets RFC. And we've talked about this a whole bunch. Um, I aggregated all of the different syntaxes um, other than the one proposed in the RFC. And I've created a gist for all the different syntaxes. So we have them all in one place. Um, so we can just go through and compare and contrast and talk about which one we like the most, um, because it would be very nice to move one of either this or multipath along. So please take a look at that. Um, and add any comments. Yeah, that would be great. Awesome. Thank you. Here we go. And now there's a new RFC. So this is another new RFC I put together. This is um, pretty straightforward, at least on the surface. Um, all this does is it proposes we add the match fields from the template level selector to the top level supply chain selector, um, which I think we have an implicit goal of like keeping these two selectors like fairly similar. Um, the big gotcha here is that this is, an, this is not a backwards compatible change. Uh, so it gets complicated. Why is it not backwards compatible? Well, that's, I think, I mean, I was going to say, so would we add match labels? And that's the piece that makes it not backwards compatible. I mean, it could be backwards compatible if we don't add match labels, but that's really not great syntax. Like, I don't want to do that, right? Oh, as in making the match labels that we have now consistent with, right? Yeah, it's because missing at like the moment, that one key. At the moment, selector is is something bespoke. Yeah. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. You could That's make okay. this we having... oh, Sorry. No, I sorry, saying... go ahead. I think we have a few breaking changes coming up. So I don't know if we like support match labels and this weird top level, no match labels thing for a little bit. I... It also like, if we do have a bunch of breaking things that we want to push through, we could look at adding a conversion webhook um, and version our supply chain. I actually called that out in the RFC down at the bottom. I want to point out, I don't think we should do this, but you could make it a mostly not breaking change by respecting labels that aren't match labels or match fields at the top level of the thing. I would not recommend that path forward, though. I think a conversion webhook, if we're, you know, we're going to need that infrastructure eventually, right? I think that's probably the right way to go. I think um, there's just a, like, there's something cautionary here to make sure that we look for, um, look, look for idioms as much as we can before we accept our RFCs on design. Especially things that, that, yeah, you know, you know what I'm saying. This, this, this existed long before this. Uh, for some reason, we used a bespoke way to select. Do we have somewhere that we're aggregating? I'm wondering if just like we could try and push the like if it makes sense to aggregate all the breaking changes into sort of a single release that's 
going to be painful, but at least it's only one painful release. We have a list of them right now. Maybe that could also be our ramp up to a 1.0. <clears throat> yeah. I think longer term, we need to have, like, this kind of change is easy to do relatively seamlessly from the user's perspective, right? They'll, they can still use the old version of the resource. We can keep that supported for as long as we want. I think longer term, we need maybe some larger you know, tap level policies around, you know, how many versions of things do we want to keep supported? You know, what does deprecation look like, right? I don't, I don't think we want to keep those old things around forever. Um, we'll probably set just in very brief conversations with other programs about this, I've heard like maybe we keep things around for six months or a year or something, right? Um, so as you're thinking about those conversion web hooks and, and when you want to time releases that collect breaking changes, imagine that you'll keep the old version supported around for significant enough that <laughs> time that you know customers really have time to move away from the old resource versions, um, but also that we won't have to keep. You know, it's not a goal to keep everything around forever, right? That there may be changes that they need to make over, you know, a longer period of time. Folks on the secure tool side are thinking about the same problems right now <laughs> and they have a bunch of breaking changes they wanna make. Right. Great, anything else regarding new RFC. If not, uh, we can move to the next one. It's, um, last week, we had a, a suggestion from Mr. Kartik Lunka and uh, on how to have a board with different columns for, to track status of RFCs. And I believe it was Rashid who first started you know, organizing this board. So um, the idea was to use this to keep track of the status and and also spend some time during office hours to actually review status and uh, okay <laughs> right now the columns are widely inaccurate so yeah maybe the proposal would be to start checking with uh, where to put the, uh, you know, each RFC in the uh, appropriate column, right, Rush? Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, if it's to work, we have to use it, right? I think I think it's helpful. I, um, I've certainly not been able to work out what the RFCs are doing and what we need. There's, um, there's definitely the, uh, I feel like the in review is maybe hopefully the important thing to draw the bead for our, uh, our maintainers that are not able to be, you know, with the team all the times, people like uh, Stephen, um, and I forget, is it Scott who's our other, like, not James? every day, or James? Anyway, one of them. Uh, you know, the, the, they look at the inner review and they, they realize that, you know, we may be looking for their, their help there to land work, right? And I hope that's how it could be helpful as well. Um, yeah, I, we should get everything that, I mean, all of the things we saw today, I think are now ready. To, it sounded like we all liked them. So maybe it's time to slam them all in the in review column, all right? Done. Thank you. I think, you know, we can ignore draft, but pending, there was intro RFC more option selectors. Although Washim is not here to talk to it, it might be better to wait until he's available if we if it can wait. Uh, it gives us a sense of what's going on. We can also just mention, you know, hey folks, we're currently working on RFC 009. Emily's done a lot of work in that area already. There's already a PR on that one. And if no one likes this, let me know. I just, it seemed like a good suggestion from another team that's similar. 
Should open we, source needs. Uh, I just, how can we get these column, these things up to date? Should we just um, take five minutes after words rush and try to? Yeah, if you think anything's inaccurate, please, please do. I think, I think it's close to right now, but um, I think my biggest concern was for some reason some didn't show up. Oh, also, by the way, David, you see the ad ad cards one new in the top. That means that person yeah. hasn't added it to the project, but it says uh, they've added it to the project, but it's set in. Oh, that was me. It's a triage. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't that yeah. doesn't belong there at all. It's just a placeholder. So I'll take the RFC flag off of that, and it won't appear. So that's where we look though for new incoming. Um, okay. And your incoming stuff that needs triage, especially from external contributors, because they won't be able to assign anything to it. Oh, that's great. And you say it's inaccurate. Would you just mean like the cards in the columns are inaccurate, or that mm -hmm. you, you want to change? Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did my best, but there was no guarantee no, that I scanned it properly. I got. It. Okay, so that's probably really close. So if you feel like you've got an RFC missing, go go sort it out, right? If you think it's got the wrong status applied to it, go sort that out. Yeah, thank you, Raj. This will be really interesting to, to get everything in a single board. Sorry, I wanted to also mention one other thing. If you've got an issue and you think it needs an RFC, throw RFC on it and put it into the proposal need column. And then we've got a chance of talking over new RFCs that need to be produced. Great, thank you, Raj. Okay, uh, next one, time to level best practices in OSS. Yeah, so Stephen brought it up, so I thought I might as well throw it down here. You talk about um, like the, the Tanzu open source organization having some ideas of what's best for maintenance, um, uh, uh, you know, maintenance versions and, and support. And I think that's great. I also know that internally we have uh, ideas about best practices for logging. And I just like things like that. I'd like to push that the, the, the Tan VMware Tanzu organization has a place for these. That's sort of like a best, best, best as you can do shared great ideas to use across the open source org. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> Even earlier, I was talking. I think I, I, I maybe uh, said a little bit too much towards the, <laughs> you know, commercial side, right? Um, the you, you're totally right that we need, or if we have guidelines for conversion webhooks across our open source projects like Cartographer and KPAC or whatever that are VMware open source, those guidelines should be, you know, public and <laughs> somewhere where we're saying, you know, for these projects, you know, here's a centralized place where we're trying to you know, present, you know, things we've come to consensus on for how, you know, we, we achieve things like that. I, I will totally bring that up um, with some folks to see if we can get something together that's more centralized for those projects. I mean, it I can think, still, still be completely open source, right? It's still yeah. somewhere where our contributors can go over there and say, well, what about this? All right. Because yeah, we have great. something like this for, you know, on the internal side, it'd be great to have something, you know, get, get the same things out you know, publicly for the open source projects. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that would be awesome. Okay, great. Um, anything else you would like to bring up here to discuss? Yeah, I, I guess then a quick, I mean, we, we did a bunch of intros to some RFCs, but we've had some in flight. Is there any discussion we need to have with this group now to, to advance any of the ones that are in review or are those already happening? Is it worth looking into the I know snippets and multipath is a big, you know, <laughs> interesting thing right now and Josh, you, you showed a bunch of different options, but you know, all those things, is it worth going through those in more detail? I'm especially curious, like, uh, you know, Zach, I'm not sure if you've seen some of those designs and it'd be really great to have your feedback. Maybe, you know, I have some opinions. <laughs> I want to see what I'm, other people I'm happy to too. talk through them. I'm happy to talk to them. I didn't want to go through them in too much detail to leave time for everything else, but uh, yeah, if we have extra time. Uh, I'm happy I... to talk through and, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rash. 
I was going to say, could I throw down one one criteria that we're looking for, which is we would like to have a solution for multipath soon. Um, and none of these are exclusionary. So um, I don't know, keep that in mind for which one we actually choose to implement first and whether it's acceptable. I guess my question is multipath acceptable enough or would it feel horrible to choose to use it uh, choose to use snippets as well and then have these two ways you could do things in the in the long run because multipath is very easy to implement comparatively or at least as far as I'm aware we could learn something from investigating all the options that Josh is pointing out that there's a quick and easy way to do snippets as well I, I, I think like both options add different kinds of complexity, right? Like multipath adds complexity, you know, in a way that I'm worried about at the top level, right? Snippets adds complexity in a way that, you know, can create indirection or create, you know, too much nesting or maybe makes you repeat stuff, right? And so I don't want to, I want to focus the conversation away from, at least right now, for what Josh is going to present from like, making a decision about doing X or Y and just look at all the options, get as many eyes on it, right? Like see if we can kind of generate a broader consensus for which one we're gonna implement first, right? Um, that, you know, where we think it's, we're really doing what the right thing for the users is, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's all right. That second part is really interesting to me because I'm definitely, when I, when I scroll through these, one thing I, I struggle with is making sure I map it back to like, what is the specific outcome I'm going to be able to do as a user at the end of this? So maybe when we look at these, someone can sort of help me um, digest like that piece of that. I think the, the really high level goal here is like, right now we can say a resource is A or B, right? One particular resource in the graph can be you know, conditional can be one resource or another resource or another resource, right? Based on some information. But sometimes mm -hmm. we want to say, actually, I either want to do this one resource or I want to do these two resources connected to each other, right? Does that make sense? I'm going to stop there. Sorry. So we did the, no, I, I need a little more. I think we got the, so we, so we did the selector thing, right? And we're working on that. And that lets me pick one of template A, B, or C. I'll be really concrete, right? Like say, say based on something in the workload, you could either pick a tecton task that does a Conoco build, or you could pick a KPAC image resource, right? Resource mm -hmm. one, resource two, right? The tecton would be one, one runnable resource, but it's, it's, you know, A or B. But say you want to do something where you either want to do a Docker file build using Conoco, or you want to do a KPAC image build, and then you want to want a tecton task after the KPAC image build, right? You either want to take one of two paths, but the paths aren't just one resource or another resource. It's one resource or an alternative tree of resources, right? I see. And then maybe you want to come back <laughs> to the same point, right? And there's two proposals for implementing this. And they both have different kinds of complexity. I have you know, opinions about <laughs> what's what's the better kind of complexity, right? And I think, you know, Rash has some other, you know, uh, I think very pertinent, right, opinions about other, other kind of complexity. And then I'm sure lots of people have different opinions about it. So it'd be great cool. to get your perspective too. So if, so the example we're going to run through is the same in all the different cases. It's the example taken from uh, Rash's multipath RFC. Um, it's in this somewhere. I think it's at the top. Yeah, so this is the example. Oh, uh, sorry, David. Uh, this spec produces this graph under what is it? That YAML block right there is what we're going to talk through in all the different use cases. So. What's interesting, what's interesting about this use case is that this allows you to take a pre-built image, or this lets you take source code, build an image, optionally run tests, um, and then proceed with the rest of your supply chain. I think there's a configure and a deploy in there or something like that. The, the interesting bit is, right, is that it can take a pre-built image, or it can build an image in a series of different steps. 
Um, so I won't get into the details of this RFC particularly, because uh, I think we've covered it a whole bunch. Um, but if you could open up all those gists, David, that were, uh, here, let me send a link. Ah, uh, yes. Right, yeah, all these ones. So this is the first proposed alternate syntax to the snippets RFC. Um, instead of having a cluster supply chain snippet type, this actually proposes that we give all supply chains a type. So this would introduce a cluster image supply chain, cluster source supply chain, cluster config supply chain, and just the, it would keep the generic cluster supply chain as well. And the idea is that each type, each supply chain that has a type inherits the same syntax as a template. So it lets you expose, um, so sorry, uh, David, if you don't mind scrolling up a bit, So if we take, for example, um, if you could go to file number zero, one or something like that. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is, the, this is a cluster image supply chain. Um, so if you look at line 10, right, this exposes the same uh, syntax as like the cluster image template, um, where you can say, my image path that gets promoted along comes from here. And if you notice the very first segment of the path is the actual resource name. So it's, yeah. So it's grabbing the image path from the build image resource, and then it's looking at its status .latest, latest image. And then leading up to this last resource, there's, there's a whole bunch of other steps that you can define in here. And then the, the main idea is that, uh, if, sorry, David, if you scroll up to the very top, to the first file, um, is if you look at line 15, you can drop a type supply chain in place of any other template. Which works because it has the same interface. And so for, for Zach, if you haven't seen some of the snippet proposals before, the idea is that you still only select one or the other, right? But mm -hmm. those different options can be entire encapsulated trees. And there's a version of this that where you could inline the supply chain inside of there to be able to see the whole tree, <laughs> you know, although it might get a little bit nested. Gotcha. Okay, and so snippet, this is like, a, this is a composability feature. So I can compose supply chains of other supply chains, but that have specifically typed outputs. Um, so I can keep growing these together. Exactly. And I think another alternative here is instead of having a whole new set of supply chain types and template types, you could overload them. So the template could be either resources or an actual you know, template and treat that as an abstraction, right? And then maybe the whole catalog just becomes you know, a mixture of templates and supply chain snippets you can reuse, right? Is that one of your variations, Josh? Yeah. That okay. is the third one down. Cool. So maybe we can talk through that one real quick. I want to make sure we have time to talk about the multipath that rash is your, your proposal also. So Zach can get a, a sense of the, a wider alternative, <laughs> if that makes sense. Because <laughs> I think it's worth, or I, you know, I definitely think it's worth talking about. Cool. Um, yeah, so the, the main difference with this uh, and the previous one that I just spoke through is um, this proposal actually keeps all of the existing templates, so it doesn't introduce any new supply chain types. Um, but David, if you scroll down to the first file, the, sorry, the second file, um, the third file maybe. Yeah, this one right here. Um, so what this proposal introduces is the idea to add resources into the templates themselves. 
So uh, line number nine. So this lets you add multiple steps to a template. And the re not to make this about my opinions, but the reason I don't like this one is that um, it changes what a template is. It really blurs the line between a supply chain and a template because now, like, to me, it used to be that a template had one, like, it, it templated a CRD and the supply chain described a graph of all the interconnections between those templates. Um, by introducing resources into a template, it really blurs that line of like what's responsible for what. Yeah, my argument against that is you're, you're already creating something other than a supply chain or a template anyway, and that it's not, that's not strong enough. Not, not that you're not right, but it's just like, that's not strong enough to me. If you've got a, if you're going to have to have this, I think I would feel as a developer, I'd just be like, well, that's a natural progression. This this object that is a is a template can be a template or a sub supply chain. They both give me this option to, and even better if I can inline a template in any of them, because sometimes I don't want to have to go and create that as the unique thing. Maybe the unique thing is this, like you've got it right here. Maybe the unique thing is this source template that is actually some other template that we reuse and then this thing that you don't, this is where it's going to be. I like this one a lot. I think uh, along those lines, something I hear from people in the ecosystem is a common anti-pattern is creating too many resources, right? Like where, where they don't either, where you could use a config map instead or where you're creating a slight different, slightly different version of something that has basically the same purpose, right? And so, you know, I worry about having all these type templates that behave the same way in a lot of contexts and then creating a whole other set of typed things that behave the same way when they're referenced in similar context, right? They're both, they're all consumed the same, like a cluster image template and a cluster, and a cluster image supply chain are all used in the same context. Do we really need to, you know, different, CRDs to define those things. Scott was just saying to me, this one is confusing from a supply chain author perspective. Yeah, I think I, from my perspective, it kind of just messes up the level of the template in the supply chain and just seems very confusing to understand from a user's perspective. Um, just the nesting within a template, which is the idea of it being a single resource, changing that around and turning it into a supply chain of itself. I think that having it as a type of a supply chain object makes it more clear that a supply chain is a chain and a template is a resource. Um, this is turning a template into a supply chain which seems a bit odd from the, you know, from someone who's writing a supply chain, it seems a bit weird. Yeah, I sort of plus on that. I think my gut is that I'd, I'd be surprised that a template is sometimes a template and sometimes a supply chain. I think that I want, like if I, if I were to say like without knowing any of the thing and like there's a lot of good reasons we have typing and stuff, like my like naive first thought would be like, if I want a sub supply chain, I'll just, create a supply chain and I, I like the, the like a cluster image supply chain and a cluster builds like those start to get weird to me but it's like can I just create another supply chain and plug it in and obviously there's the nuance to like we care about that typed output but if I really thought about like what felt natural that would be like my first gut response yeah the other the other drawback in my mind to pursuing this option is that templates aren't runnable, right? Like I can't just submit a template to a cluster and have it actually run. So if I'm the team that just wants to care about the just the build process, if we have type supply chains, then I can just submit that and actually just run it in the cluster and test it out. The only, th the only thing I get nervous about is for having like these optional outputs on the cluster supply chains is like we've we've already made the choice that we care about certain types of output and we've drawn those lines and now we're saying oh now we have these optional outputs 
And it's like, okay, well, we could, we could go back to day one and have optional outputs on just one type of template, right? Yeah, that's what I wrote there. <laughs> <laughs> we've made the choice that we want typed outputs. So that's the only, I like the idea of, oh, let me just create an, a sub supply chain basically. But then I feel like we're, we're going back on what our original yeah. stance was of the typed outputs. I'm definitely not arguing strongly for that or at any point yet. I'm just sort of like, if I were to, if you were just to ask me what I wanted. And no, I like, like it also, the, Zach. So, thought, right? so it's kind yeah. of interesting. Agreeing with you, but I'm a little hesitant. I'm also wondering like, and I also like, what I really like is that we're walking through uh, a real world example. Like this is a real supply chain that we know we want to build and that people want to build. So like, I really dig that. I am also trying to think a little bit about like future arbitrary complexity and like how much we care about that. Um, and to that end, I'm wondering, like, so like in the, the image, I love the, the link, by the way, I don't know if everyone saw this, but the giant pile of link uh, that Ciro gave us for, for the graph here. Um, but um, like, I'm trying to imagine a world where, um, yeah, so in, the, in sort of the third column over, you, you, so, you, so you can sort of see the trees, right? Source tester is relevant when the source is source code, and then I want to build an image. So like, that's a really valuable subtree, right? And then there's the other one that is like, oh, well, source is already an image. So my subtree is only one long, right? And, and that makes sense. And then maybe there's, you know, what does it look like if there's a third um, row here that also wants to do source testing, but doesn't want to, I don't know, do, I, I don't know what a real example is, but has some other sort of thing there. Do you see what I'm saying where the branch would sort of like go around? Um, and so, like I said, I like us being based on concrete examples, but does do any of our approaches support like that level of configurability? This one. This one does. <laughs> the one, the no, the, the, the one shown, which is based off of multipath. Yeah. Designed to this take one. any graph because it is just a graph. Not this one here on the screen, but the multipath one. But, we, but the others will too, too, right? The others they will too. too. Yeah. But this was designed specifically for that. I'm just saying because I know the designer. <laughs> You, you can do, you can add any kind of complexity like that into the snippets one by encapsulating. You can have like, you can have three options per, you know, thing that encapsulates oh, right, right, right. trees, right? It, so it's yeah. possible it just gets okay. verbose, but we should totally, let's let's show, I want to show Rash's <laughs> multipath example, because I think it solves this without as much verbosity, but it also creates, like, I, I think it creates a different kind of complexity at the top level. And I'm not saying I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, about favoring one or the other, but you know, like I, I definitely want to, sorry, Zach, I want to I see what you think about that as someone coming into this fresh. Can I also just make a request that if someone has spare time to give us an example of some deep complexity and branching that's still based on reality, because I know that there are discussions, if they could give us an explanation of that situation so that we can actually run them through these RFCs, that would be great. I haven't taken the time out because I've got other things to work on, but I would love to see all of these. Well, not all think, of these, the best of both of these tested out. I think we can do that. And I think we can actually do that really easily by just the like, um, the source here's So here's an example of the source one. If I look at the source and I, I dig into its guts and I see a Docker file, I would like to just do a Docker build. If I don't see a Docker file, I would like to do a KPAC image build. And that would give us that actual third row complexity that's, that's a versus different, an image input. That's different again. That's where, and this is something, that's where dynamics. a lot of us, yeah, that's dynamicism. And we would like to answer dynamicism with something that's I, good at dealing with it as a. So we, we don't have to make that a dynamicism as this is interesting. Obviously you all have talked about that. And I think I'm assuming I understand what that means, uh, but I don't know if you have to introduce that. Like, I think you can use that use case without introducing it by saying that there's some magic step that knows how to, like we can put a black box on there that says it's able to determine the difference for you, right? And then the logic tree still well, exists. I, I think a problem is that the commit that has the Docker file or build pack in it is gonna flow through the graph. And so different parts of the graph could be at different states at the same time. Now, if you said you're gonna mark your workload CR to say, this is a Docker file app, or this is a build pack app, and you're not gonna drive it from the source code itself, then it's fine. Then it's a static problem. But when it's a dynamic problem, 
this whole thing becomes <laughs> yeah. well, a different. Then maybe the, let's let's break that down into the second problem of let's try and come up with some good concrete use cases. And or your image builder produces the... your image builder knows how to see that and produces an image because the yeah, idea is true. no no type of input or output has changed. So the solve for that one is simply the image builder is better at handling source, turning it into an image one way or other, which is where I'm saying we push it down into resources where they have to be capable of that sort of thing. Otherwise, we will never be we will never be able to be anything other. Okay, this this is hyperbole, but this is my feeling. We'll end up being another pipeline tool and not a choreographer if we don't stay with determinism. It's possibly hyperbole, but I'd love to have that argument one day. Um, could, could we move over to talking about the kind of multipath thing? And Rash, do you want to talk about multipath a little bit? Give Zach an idea of what that looks like. Or I, I could do it. I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> you, you're muted. I don't know. Oh, yeah. So, uh, David, if you could stop sharing, I'll, I'll bring it up wherever I can find it. Because it doesn't have a number. I can't find it. Oh, it's linked in the chat. Cheers. I wonder why I can't find it. That's curious. Thank you. Yeah, OK. So in this spec, it's, are you familiar with the current RFC to have um, options be able to select on different fields? Um, yeah. Zach, yeah. yeah. So the extension point here is that options can also select on inputs. So to create this kind of behavior where, um, let's start with this simple one here. No, actually, this one's simpler. Let's start with configure. Configure can choose to uh, to configure a something that's an image that's been pr provided by the source the source path or it can choose to provide a um, to configure an image that's being provided straight out of a registry. And so just looking at the name of it, configure. So configure has two sources. And basically the rule is the first of these that will be selected for. So we traverse the graph, we look at it and we say, um, whatever selectors bunch up. So this one, uh, we'll bunch up because this actually looks for a field that says uh, um, spec.git versus uh, spec.source.git uh, versus spec.source.url. So we'll definitely select on this side and not on this side. Or this one says, um, I will select from uh, spec.image. And so we'll choose the path that provides an input, that will provide an input. We don't necessarily stamp them out yet, but we can deterministically work out which one is going to be selected for. And so we, and, and, and this should be an error, but we have a problem where it can't necessarily be an error if both of them would select. Uh, but what we do is we select for the first one that occurs because the scenario where it could be an error is this situation here where the image builder selects on the input either from the source tester or the source provider. This one's always provided. Right, because without this, you can't get a source tester. So this output is always going to be provided. So this one can't select on, it can't error that it gets both of them. We simply have to choose to pick the first one that selects, which would be the source tester. And so in the case of the image builder, we say from the source tester or from the source provider. And this graph is literally generated from that spec. So if you wanted to add another configure step um, based on some other input that you've set up a partial chain for, you just draw a line from the configure to that and say, that's also a possible input. That's the design. Does that made sense? I think it does. Um, and I think it's, I think it's interesting. I think like the thing I'm trying to, like some of this subtree stuff to me feels if I have the right word, but 
it feels like we're building mini pipelines and sticking them together, right? And I sort of think like we talk about choreographer as this, like in my head, the way I think of it is it's sort of this like pub sub system based on Kate's statuses and it's, it's APIs, right? And so it's sort of like, can I just sub to a stat? Like, why do I have to care whether I'm associated to some special subtree or some special thing uh, in terms of like a subcluster or whatever? And why, why aren't I just subscribing to the output of some, some source? And when I see it, I, I do my job, right? And we sort of get that, that choreographed thing. And this feels closer to that spirit. Not, not to say that that's our, our guiding light or anything. I just like, when I think about what I've heard choreographer talked about, it sort of, sort of stands closer to that. So I think that's at least interesting. To me, this, it, it lets you drive the decisions based on the inputs, right? So like you can have conditionals at, at one level that say this is a resource or this is another resource. Um, but then later down in the graph, right? You can have two options that don't have a conditional that are driven by whether one input higher up in the graph or another was selected. And then you, from that, you can have more, you know, like things that are driven by decisions further up the graph. And I think it makes for, it's like a very clean, like you don't have to have a lot of nesting. You don't, you know, um, you know, it, it doesn't it encapsulate complexity, but it, it also brings that complex, it makes the graph many graphs at the same time. And I worry that that's not very concrete, right? Sorry, Rash. No, 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 it's good. I just, the, the one thing that I was thinking when I tried this approach was simply how can I make sure that all I'm really, the only approach I'm taking is how can I turn conditionals into declarations, right? That's the thing that was in my head, which is like, like uh, can, you know, prefer polymorphism basically, right? The pattern, right? So the pattern in my head was simply how can we make the, the like the, imperative if this then that something that is declarative and what was important and valuable to me was that at the configure for example or at the image builder i was just saying what matters to me is that you've got me a source that i can configure like an image that i can configure what where have i got inputs for that are oh, here and here so most of the time sorry i'll go back to sharing most of the time uh, so in the case of like configure here and even an image builder here, you're always expecting the same type, right? And the decision you're making is where can I possibly get that from? And I don't have to think beyond that, hopefully, right? Um, but there is another choice you make, which is, well, this one's the field's choice. Sorry, this is not the input's choice. That's right. I was going to argue for, for the RFC we already accepted because I, I, I parallel invented that so that I wasn't, I just, I came up with all of the things I wanted and it was a parallel invention of what Oshima had already suggested. So yeah, I don't need to argue for, for why I, that's the other thing that you can do with options because we already implemented options. I came up with options because it solved both of those problems. And now it seems to me it's consistent to keep solving these problems using options. I, I know we're out of time. I, I think, one thing I keep coming back to is like, I can imagine an interface for dragging and dropping boxes and connecting them together that lets you encapsulate supply chains into boxes. But I have a hard time imagining that interface. And I know you have a good graph, right? But like as an end user, right? I'm gonna like create multiple options at a point, but I, they're not associated with the conditional, they're associated with multiple paths that could happen up to the graph, right? It, it seems like it'd be hard, right? That, like, I keep, I keep coming back to like, uh, you know, it's really clean. Like when you do a nesting example, it gets pretty far out, right? But, you know, I, <laughs> I'm having a hard time getting past that. Like, I don't know how a user gets one view of it, what's going to happen, right? Um, like, like can cleanly understand, right? The possible options, right? If, if all the graphs are laid on top of each other and they have to somehow configure those when they're dragging and dropping those boxes together. Right, thinking about like a UI we could build in the future. Yeah, and my argument is that you. you I don't know how it would work with about an edge. Sorry, go go, Josh. Yeah, I, I would. I don't know how it would work with uh, drag and drop. The multipath definitely lends itself to autocomplete really well, right? And so when you're actually authoring the resource, right, you're sitting there figuring out like what input I want. Um, it's it'd be super easy to do an autocomplete of like you have two options, pick one. And to me, that's a pretty good user experience. 
<laughs> I've even got a live editor to show you that too, if you want it. <laughs> but would somebody really understand, like, if they're look even in that graph you show there, right? Like, it, it, it's not it's not clear to me if it's a fan in fan out or if there's optional things. It's like you have a conditional further in the graph that can drive multiple options that are overlaid on top of the same graph that can drive multiple options that are overlaid on top of the same graph, right? I, like, so I, 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 I know, I, I understand what you're talking about, but I thought about these things as I went. One of the things you can't see here is that I modified this into uh, something that supports um, field selectors, right? So you can't see that at the moment. Um, because I wasn't showing field selectors here, I'm only visualizing label selectors, but there are field selectors here. And what I think I could show you very quickly is that as I hover over one of these, I can show you the multiple paths that they could land on. And for each of those paths, highlight the selectors that were required to get them. And then if I pop a workload down, I, but we can do this with all of them. We can do this with all of them, but, and, and I think that's what we should do is we should visualize editing for people which is why i'm working hard on making an editor because i don't think it i again that's why i would like to see the more complicated example because i feel like i would happily do mock-ups or even a live editor now that i've got the live editor working that showed you that if you dropped in a workload this is what would select and you can know by highlighting it makes sense i, I gotta drop for another call this is yeah, great sorry though. Okay, thank you all for joining. Uh, see you next week and hope we can keep conversation async. Thank you. <laughs>